Thanks, everybody, for being here. These are very exciting times. Um, so my name is Dan Fulton. I'm an infectious disease doctor here at Mary Greeley Medical Center and at McFarland Clinic uh, in Ames, Iowa. And we wanted to have a chance to talk today primarily about vaccines um, uh, and, and what we're seeing and, and thinking and how we're planning to approach all of that. And also, I think, too, for just a brief uh, COVID-19 update. Um, I appreciate the uh, few folks that are here in the audience and, um, you know, we we're all uh, very nicely distant from each other. Um, so, uh, and thanks everybody um, out there in the virtual world uh, for being here as well. So, um, in terms of disclosures, I don't really have any specific disclosures. I don't work for any companies and don't get any financial support um, from any drug companies or pharmaceutical companies. Uh, I do have a bias towards science in general. Um, I think that the scientific method can really help us uh, draw some conclusions about our world. Uh, I also think that we should acknowledge that 2020 has been a really uh, incredible year um, in so many ways. And I put that on my disclosures in part because things have been changing so fast that this presentation is already probably a little bit obsolete. So just keep that in mind as we go and uh, things you know, continue to change. We talked a little bit about this last time. I think um, back in May, six months ago, uh, when we last talked, I kind of felt like we were about here. We were kind of through the initial, you know, let's, let's do this, let's um, uh, take care of people uh, phase. And we were starting to realize that this was gonna be a longer lasting process. And, and now I kind of feel like we're in here. We're starting to get close to the first anniversary of um, some of our own COVID memories. And, um, you know, I, I think it's just important to name that because it, uh, it's been a really challenging year. It's not all bad, though. So some of you may know that uh, my wife and I had twin girls in June. So that's girls number four and five for us. Um, so, you know, we all have things about this year that, that have been okay, too. Uh, and, you know, even as everything is changing so much, some things don't change. So the rules are the same. We're going to focus on number one, don't panic. Number two, be positive. And number three, kindness counts. Um, and a big thank you to Joelle Sprecher for uh, these onesies. They wear them every day, almost. Um, oh, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention that another big change in our department is that we welcomed Dr. Lindsay Rearai um, about a month ago now. She comes to us from the University of Nebraska, which um, you may be aware is, is one of the world uh, centers of expertise when it comes to infection prevention. Uh, and in fact, the earliest COVID cases in the country went to the University of Nebraska. And so she brings with her a real profound depth of knowledge and uh, we're excited to uh, learn from her and appreciate uh, everything she'll be bringing with her um, to our practice. So thank you, Lindsay, for being with us. I also wanted to make a special note of this, this whole back to school um, notion because I think, especially this fall over the last few months, uh, there's been a huge group of people that have kind of been welcomed to the front line in a sense, and that's all the teachers, whether it's um, you know elementary school or high school or university professors, everybody that is now again engaging um, with other people on a daily basis. and. You know, they too have been going through a real um, epidemic of change in their lives from full-time in-person to hybrid to all online back to hybrid. Uh, and, you know, I just think across the board, um, people have, you know, had this challenge of, of having to change things a lot as they go. And I think I was talking to somebody the other day about how as we go forward, eventually we're going to have to unpack that and kind of figure out what did that mean to us? Uh, in, this, in the setting of so much change, though, you end up just kind of having to move on and keep going. And um, I've just been so impressed with everyone from our workers here to people in the community to other frontline workers uh, to everybody that, you know, has made the effort to be at home throughout all this, whether they're uh, elderly with health conditions or workers that are working remotely. I mean, this, this whole year has been a real... Uh, uh, who could have imagined it a year ago? So thank you to everybody up front. And um, let's jump into kind of the medical stuff. So we're going to talk a little bit about epidemiology, but I do think one benefit of 
COVID-19 is that we are all sort of epidemiology 101 trained now. Everybody knows about epidemiology. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what we're doing for treatment right now, and then we're going to talk about the vaccine. So this is the current epidemiology in the United States. Um, I, I remember when this felt like a lot of cases. Uh, I remember this mostly happened elsewhere. We had some cases here this summer, but not a lot. But we definitely felt this uh, here in Iowa and at uh, Mary Greeley. So here's the Iowa epidemiology curves. Um, and you can see here little bumps early on. You know, they felt like big bumps, but they look small here compared to what's been going on for the last month or so. Uh, and uh, we are beyond this now at about 2,700 uh, deaths here in Iowa. And this is our Mary Greeley data. And um, I wanted to point out a few things. We definitely had this big, big uh, increase in November. And the deaths that we've had over the past five weeks uh, equal the number of deaths that we had in the prior six months. So it was a, a real huge change for us in November. And some of you may have seen this uh, talk that I gave. I guess it wasn't really a talk. It was a, it was a, a public relations announcement. Um, I was kind of breaking my own rule. I feel like we were all panicking a little bit because we were seeing, uh, seeing these numbers just increase so rapidly and exponentially. Um, and, you know, I think the danger here is we are coming down a little bit off of that slope. Uh, it feels like we have a little breathing space, at least in terms of our numbers. Uh, but the relativity of it all, you start to lose perspective. We still have a lot of patients in-house with COVID, and we are still having people that are dying from this infection. Uh, even though it's a little bit better than two weeks ago, um, it is still so much worse than it was in April, you know, when we first encountered all this. So all that to say, um, I really appreciate all of the ongoing work of all of the healthcare providers across the system because um, this is a daily effort, a daily strain, and, and um, you know, people feel it over time. It's just, it's a, it's a relentless um, siege of, of work on top of the work that um, they're already doing. So uh, again, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I think this is an important piece of epidemiology. You know, numbers are numbers, and it's so hard for us to not be abstract about numbers. Uh, this is a series by the Des Moines Register, uh, really going into the folks' lives who have died and talking with their families and really naming them uh, and, and bringing them to light as the people that they uh, were rather than another number on our daily epidemiology screen. Uh, so if you have time to, to go and read some of these, uh, they're really quite profound and powerful. When it comes to the clinical aspects of COVID-19, I really think that we have um, started to think about this disease as a two-phased disease. There is the early phase, which is really when we worry more about the virus, uh, and then there is the late phase when we're really more worried about the inflammation. And I think time and, and experience with this virus does seem to, to fit with this model uh, very well. So early on, people will get kind of a, a mild respiratory illness. The virus has already been working for several days by the time you get any symptoms, and you may have already been contagious. Um, so when we talk about treatment early on, we want to think about antivirus treatments, um, what can happen uh, is that then the immune system, as it starts to react to this virus, it starts to overreact. And that's really where we start to see the, the real challenges with uh, breathing and other downstream negative effects of that. So this is where we focus on our anti-inflammation treatments. So when it comes to this virus, I shared this slide last time, you know, normal lung virus gets in, starts to inflame the normal lung, the lung sometimes can resolve this process or sometimes fills up with inflammation and then scarring because of the damage that this virus did. So here you want antivirus treatment, down here you want anti-inflammation treatment. If you give anti-inflammation treatment too soon, um, there's not a lot of it to knock down and you can actually make the virus worse by allowing the virus to get farther down the road. So there's this real delicate balance between um, those two sides of the balance beam. So um, in terms of the antiviral phase one aspect of treatment, there was some early interest in hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. I think there's still some interest um, 
in different parts of the world uh, and the United States. I do think that studies have shown it does not help people that are in the hospital and it is not effective for prevention. There are some studies ongoing for mildly ill people that don't need to be in the hospital. Um, I think based on it not working in other populations, I, I really don't think it probably works um, effectively uh, in terms of any meaningful outcome. Uh, this was a, you know, such a cool story and some of this data um, unfortunately broke my heart a little bit. So convalescent plasma, we were all very excited about this early on. We were early adopters of this approach and, um, you know, we'd, we were part of the Mayo Clinic study and I really loved the community spirit about convalescent plasma where once people had this virus then they would go on to donate and sort of pay it forward. Um, unfortunately, just a couple weeks ago, a really big study came out and showed that it didn't seem like it really made much difference. So when we compare convalescent plasma to somebody just getting a little bit of uh, salt water infusion uh, over time, if you look at outcomes, there just wasn't, wasn't much difference in outcome. Uh, I think there's probably some subpopulations where this still works, especially people who have immune dysfunction, uh, where they really can't make their own antibodies. Um, uh, and I think time will answer that question. But in terms of using it as a standard approach uh, for most of our hospitalized patients, I don't think we're going to be doing that going forward. Okay. Uh, remdesivir is an antivirus medicine. Uh, it works by kind of inserting itself in the mechanism that the virus uses to replicate itself. And then it's like it, it keeps the virus from like letting go uh, and being able to be released. It, I was thinking about this kind of like, um, well, the photo didn't show up. I was thinking about it like that Mr. Bean character in the movie Love Actually, where you like go to a store and the person just keeps talking to you over and over and you just can't get away from them. And um, so this works in a test tube and it turns out that it did work um, when it came to uh, patients. It was able to shorten the duration of people in the hospital and it probably has some mortality benefit also. You can see these lines diverge, but the, the confidence intervals were close enough that they couldn't conclude it had a mortality benefit. Um, but it is part of the recommended treatment right now, and we're using it essentially in every patient we have that, um, that uh, has severe disease. Uh, this is another exciting story. We participated in uh, these studies here at Mary Greeley. Uh, these are antibodies that are made in a lab and they are uh, meant to stick to the virus, the part of the virus that attaches to the cell and allows it to get in. And so if somebody has uh, COVID-19 diagnosed and they're a high risk person, but maybe they're not sick enough to be in the hospital, that's really the niche for these antibodies. You give them very early uh, in the treatment course. And the goal is to try and keep somebody from getting sicker later. And indeed the studies have shown that uh, in people that, um, uh, got the placebo, about six and a half percent of them ended up in the hospital compared to around one to two percent if they got these treatments. So, you know, that four to five percent decrease um, may not sound like a lot, but if you consider somebody's in the hospital generally for seven to 10 to 14 days, sometimes even longer, um, that can really help uh, with our, our hospital overload situation and, you know, likely down the road prevent bad outcomes for patients. The challenge of these um, treatments is that it's still an infusion. And so what we've had to do here is figure out a place to give this infusion in a safe way. We couldn't use our usual infusion centers because those are usually um, full of people with cancer. So we really got to uh, keep people safe. And um, real kudos to all of the administrators and infection prevention people that uh, got together to figure this out. We do um, have a kind of a COVID infusion clinic here at Mary Greeley. Uh, it's been a real collaborative effort and um, you know, still we have limitations in terms of space. So uh, we've got a schedule going and um, we've communicated with our physicians about how to get people enrolled in that if they, they quali qualify. So that's, um, that's kind of it in terms of real good antiviral treatments. There's, there's a lot of things out there that people consider, but in terms of things that have been really well studied, um, that's, that's the armamentarium that we have. Uh, if we think about anti-inflammation, there's been talk about dexamethasone. This is a commonly used steroid, and this was shown in a really big study um, to uh, decrease the risk of death. Uh, again, 
if you look at the dexamethasone arm of this study, it did decrease, but we're still up here at about 20% at one month for people that came into the hospital in this study. Now, that was higher than usual, um, but even so, it's, it's, not a, it's not a magic bullet and it doesn't cure everything. Um, and there's risks with it too. We've seen higher rates of secondary infections here in the hospital uh, when people have been getting steroids and blood sugars are a lot harder to control on steroids too. Uh, but it is something we're using in the majority of patients that are ill uh, because of this benefit. Uh, this is a therapy that had some early excitement about it and we've used it uh, I think once here. Um, it's a, a rheumatology medication. It's an anti-inflammation medicine. Uh, and unfortunately, a big trial was just published here that, uh, or that showed that it didn't have any benefit. Um, so I would say this is kind of like convalescent plasma where there might be some benefit in subpopulations uh, and to kind of be used on a, a patient-specific basis. Um, and I want to talk about this one in particular because there are multiple rheumatology drugs that are being um, put out there with anti-inflammation properties. And, um, and I think over time, we'll see, is there any real benefit, especially if you're also using steroids, which decrease the inflammation already. This drug, baricitinib, was just recently shown to have some very mild benefit when given with that antivirus medicine, the remdesivir. The challenge is that this study didn't use any steroids, which are now kind of the standard of care. So because of that, you know, our plan is not to jump on this bandwagon of treatment because we're using steroids and we need to have a study where they go head to head um, or this is added to steroids instead. And then there's all sorts of other treatments um, that are not necessarily antiviral or anti-inflammation um, uh, that, you know, have been posited and maybe small studies showed some benefit, but just um, there's just not enough data to conclude uh, that we should be using these regularly. Um, so what we're doing is for mild to moderate COVID-19 and somebody that's low risk, uh, they're getting enrolled in home monitoring as an outpatient. And I cannot say enough about all the folks that have invested time and effort in that program. I mean, we're talking about hundreds of patients at a time sometimes. Um, so thank you all for that. And then patients that are high risk, uh, if we have availability um, and they're able we have the uh, monoclonal antibody. And again, those are for outpatients. And, you know, I would say the risk of a baby aspirin or vitamin D, C, or zinc is all pretty low. Uh, those supplements are things that you could consider if you thought your patient might be, for some reason, vitamin deficient. Um, but again, there's not a lot of strong data to support any of those. And in inpatient, um, inpatient realm, we're definitely giving the remdesivir and dexamethasone. We're also giving... Um, usually blood thinners that are guided by some blood tests because people are at higher risk of blood clots. And this, the top two of this, the supportive care and oxygen piece, um, you know, there is so much that goes into that when it comes to critically ill patients in the intensive care unit um, that we could spend hours and hours talking about that. And, um, you know, I just have so much gratitude for all of the nursing effort um, that goes into all of those different parts of supported care. I mean, these patients are sick. They can't get out of bed. They, they need help with almost everything. And really, um, the nursing teams have gone above and beyond time and again. So we do have more treatment options than we had before. Unfortunately, none of, none of those things are you know, super effective or magic bullets. Um, and the problem is just with viruses, and this is true of most viruses, by the time you know you have it, it's already been doing its replication thing and you already have billions, if not trillions, of little virus particles running around. And by the time you give antivirus treatments, they're just, it's already off to the races. And then the other side of the equation is by the time somebody's sick enough to actually end up in the hospital, uh, again, using steroids at that point may help some, but they're already really sick. And so you face uh, a, steep, a steep hill to climb. Which brings us to vaccination. You know, we don't have awesome treatments for COVID-19. It continues to be severe infection, getting, getting worse with these waves, and, um, you know, a lot of people still dying. So with many viruses, uh, vaccination really has been uh, the ticket for how we treat. We prevent the disease. And so I wanted to share with you first a little perspective. Uh, this is a different virus, poliovirus. Uh, most of us have been vaccinated against poliovirus, um, but back in the 1900s, we didn't have a vaccine, and uh, there was actually 21,000 cases of paralysis in children in 1955. If you can imagine that, if you think about your own kids, that's terrifying. 
turns out that was only about 1% of the people that actually got this virus. You know, you, you think about coronavirus and some people don't get very sick from that. That does not mean it's severe. Some people got really sick from polio virus, uh, including some famous people. There's uh, FDR. And so I share this timeline with you for a few reasons. Polio was discovered in 1905. We didn't actually get a licensed vaccine for 55 years from its discovery, which is really um, phenomenal if you think about what we're talking about otherwise today. The other thing I want to share with you is um, this 1955 incident, the Cutter incident. What was happening was they had developed a, a virus um, vaccine that they would kill with formaldehyde, and then they would inject that dead virus into a person, uh, and then the body would react to it, and you would be protected. Well, unfortunately, uh, some of the batches of polio virus were not being fully killed, and so people actually were getting polio from their vaccine, which is dreadful. And I think when we think about when vaccines and how we all think about vaccines, especially if we're talking about something new like a coronavirus vaccine, it makes sense that people would enter that conversation with some degree of trepidation because it is new and nobody's really gone through this before. Um, so I want to be able to talk with you a little bit today about um, what reassures me uh, about the coronavirus vaccines that are coming out. Uh, and also to share that if we get a vaccine that works, um, it can make such a big difference. Um, I wanted to share this photo um, because this is my dad. And he was actually born here at Mary Greeley in 53. <clears throat> and they lived up in northern Minnesota, I think, when, when this was happening. I think this was um, 1962. So here he is with his five brothers. And uh, he told me what he remembers from this event was that he got to eat a sugar cube. Which, you know, there's, there's my uh, Uncle Chris, and he's definitely eating a sugar cube right there. Um, but, you know, I, I really thought about this from the standpoint of his parents or my grandparents and, you know, what, what they must have been thinking at the time. Uh, <clears throat> but then, you know, you take the next step and you look at the polio curve. And what you see here is that with the advent of the polio vaccine, polio went away. <clears throat> so, you know, I do think that it's okay to, to have some trepidation about vaccines. And I also think it's, it's important to acknowledge that, you know, people have a lot of courage when they, they go into the unknown. But it can make such a huge difference for everyone um, that it's something worth worth really thinking about. This is the measles vaccine. Uh, we saw a similar thing here right after the measles vaccine was, um, was uh, approved. You can see measles just melted away and we've really not seen much by way of measles uh, since then. Um, so this, this really feels like we are on the, the cusp of a big change when it comes to coronavirus. So that, that history matters. I want to share a little bit with you about immunology. My hope is that just like we've all become miniature epidemiologists, we will all become miniature immunologists over the next uh, few months. Um, you know, this is a dramatic simplification of how the immune system works. Uh, and I had a conversation with uh, Dr. Bill Nassif uh, over at the University of Iowa a few years ago, and I joked with him. He's an inflammation specialist. I joked with him that sometimes with the immune system, it seems like what we're trying to do is watch the first three moves of a chess match and then predict the outcome. And he laughed at me and he said, Dan, we don't even know the pieces on the board. So the immune system is... Uh, beautiful and elegant and hopelessly complex. And we're going to try and really boil down to some kind of uh, simple things that we think we know about the immune system. And, and, and I don't tell you that story to make it seem like immunologists don't know anything. I mean, that they are brilliant when you think about all these different factors that are involved. And we know so much more now than we even did, you know, compared to 2010 when this was published. But basically, a virus encounters your immune system uh, when it gets brought into a cell and then uh, those cells encounter those proteins from the virus and share that virus with um, this part of your immune system uh, that helps train your immune system to make cells that then form antibodies that then fight back against that virus. 
Your body also has some ways of fighting back immediately against infected cells by immediately attacking those cells when they recognize that they're infected, even without any notion of memory. So uh, what we want a vaccine to do is to provide us with a reservoir of antibodies that are hanging out in our system that can immediately attach to a virus once it enters into our body. And beyond that, we also want a reservoir of memory cells that continue to make that antibody over time so that that immunity is long lasting. Uh, so we're gonna skip this one. So I'm gonna simplify it even more. So I drew this on my whiteboard in my office um, and I deeply apologize to all the cell biologists out there. This is, you know, I, I appreciate you all and I'm gonna just do it this way. So. So here's your little virus. Um, it's got a little protein on its surface called spike. Here's a little receptor on the cell, which in this case is an angiotensin converting enzyme number two receptor. And so that little spike fits into that little spot. And then that allows the virus to come in to your body. Once the virus is in the body, this little bit of RNA uh, gets um, let out, and that RNA then uses the body's machinery and some prepackaged pro proteins to make more RNA. Those then get reassembled and processed. There's another processing step here I didn't draw um, until you get new little virus particles, and then those explode the cell and go in search of more cells uh, to infect. Uh, you'll notice that with coronavirus in particular, there's not a lot of involvement of the nucleus of the cell, which is where your DNA lives, uh, what makes you, you. Um, so that is a super simplified way of how coronavirus um, kind of replicates itself. So when we think about all the different types of vaccines that are in development, um, they generally fall into four categories. So the first one is the one I think that we're most familiar with. This is called an antigen or protein-based vaccine. This is like what our influenza vaccines are. Uh, basically, you give that little spike protein with something attached to it to help turn the immune system on, and the body pulls that protein in, and then the whole immune inflammation cascade starts from that point onward. So this is not a living thing, it's just a protein and your body responds to it, you know, just like if you got a little bit of, you know, metal under your skin, your body has to chew through it and get rid of it. And so um, this is a long, a well understood way of doing vaccination. And the current coronavirus one is called Novavax. Um, they just published their phase one and two trial, um, the journal I got today. Uh, and it looked like it was, um, it was good at producing antibody and it had minimal side effects. Um, so I anticipate that these types of vaccines will be coming online for coronavirus in the coming uh, year. Um, unfortunately, it does take a little while to make these antigens. You have to figure out exactly how to do it and then what to attach it to so that it causes enough an immune response. So these are not as fast to make from when you know about a virus. There's inactivated virus. So this is, you know, basically you take coronavirus and you figure out a way to kill it or some other virus that you kind of attach the spike protein to, but it's, it's just a dead virus. And so it, it'll still attach at first, but once it gets into the cell, it just doesn't go anywhere because it's not alive. And the virus itself and that RNA starts this inflammation cascade uh, as well. There's uh, attenuated viruses or living viruses um, where basically they have worked to attach the spike protein to different viruses that our body is pretty easy, pretty good at getting rid of, uh, like adenoviruses. So they're, they're alive, they'll go in and they'll try and replicate, um, but they, they lack the appropriate machinery to finish their replication process. So they kind of get stopped at this step and that starts the immune cascade as well. And um, AstraZeneca and Janssen are the two that we may see uh, here, AstraZeneca is in phase three trials uh, right now. Um, and then here's the mRNA vaccine. Uh, we have two of these, Pfizer and Moderna. Uh, and we're going to talk about all that in depth. But my little drawing of this is they take a little bit of what's called messenger RNA, mRNA. And your body uses mRNA with everything it does. If your body needs to make a protein 
based on your own DNA, it'll make some mRNA in the nucleus, send that out of the nucleus, and then that mRNA gets used to make a protein. So uh, mRNA vaccines have actually been around now um, for several years. They've actually been focused more on anti-cancer treatments, where if we could put a little bit of a cancer RNA to make a cancer protein, we could actually train the human immune system to fight cancer. Um, there has not been a, a reason to really deeply engage with mRNA vaccines um, beyond that. Uh, there was some limited stuff um, being done with Zika and with Ebola, uh, but certainly nothing widespread. Uh, so I say all that because mRNA uh, technology has been studied for decades when it comes to vaccination. And even a couple years ago, it was pretty much ready for prime time. It just needed something to go after. So uh, they put this little bit of messenger RNA, uh, which they sequence based on the coronavirus spike protein. So this is a little bit of genetic sequence to make that spike protein. They surround it with uh, basically fat because your outside of your cell is fat, and so it'll help bring it in. Um, so it attaches here to the cell wall and gets brought in, and that little bit of RNA gets released into the cytoplasm of your cell. I want to point out that this goes nowhere near your nucleus. It does not go into your DNA in any way. It's not even in the same space. This is out in the peripheral part of your cells. And the machinery of your cells encounters that mRNA and uses it to make the spike protein. This is the same spike protein that your immune system is encountering if you actually get coronavirus. So that spike protein then is what initiates the immune cascade that leads to uh, immunity going forward. Um, so it's almost like these protein vaccines that we're quite familiar with in the sense that we're using an mRNA bit of genetic material to make the spike protein, but it's almost like a better version because it gets made just like a virus spike protein would be made and you're... Uh, your cell can then encounter it in a little bit more of a, what I would call a natural way. So there's no entrance of this into the nucleus. So there's no way that this can alter your DNA. And that's something that's come up in a lot of different concerns, I think. And uh, I, I cannot see any mechanism that this would in any way affect your DNA or last beyond its expected lifespan. The half-life of mRNA usually in the cell is on the order of 10 to 15 minutes. It doesn't last very long. It, the whole point is that it's a, a transient communication from the nucleus to the outside to make proteins. So, um, you know, it's going to go into the cells. It's going to be used by the cells to make the spike protein. And then the real immune response is going to be to the spike protein. Um, that's very simplified. There's probably some immune response to mRNA also, which may help with memory. So what we want when we have a vaccine is basically this. So um, if this is the amount of inflammation or immunity in your body, you want to get the vaccine, you want to have enough that it works to prevent future infection at this line, but you'd rather not have side effects, especially even if they're mild, and you definitely don't want to have a severe reaction up here. So this would be just the perfect vaccine. And the longer it stays in this efficacy range, uh, the better. What we uh, think will probably happen with this vaccine is something more like this, where it will go up and it looks like about 20% of people will get some side effects, which we're going to discuss uh, in depth. Um, but then those side effects eventually, they go away um, as that amount of inflammation drops. And then you have this longer lasting um, uh, immune response that is protective. What we really don't want to happen with the vaccine is this. So you don't want to have any severe reactions um, and so, you know, the thing about severe reactions is they are not always very common um, uh, with vaccines. And so you need big trials to make sure that you are finding even uncommon reactions. Uh, and so we have essentially between these two studies of Pfizer and Moderna, about 60,000 patients that have been uh, studied, about 40,000 of them got the vaccine. And what we were looking for was anything in this realm of very severe, um, which we really didn't see. So even if you have a long-lasting effect, if you cause some terrible uh, side effect, that's not a good vaccine. This is the opposite. This is also not a good vaccine. So if you give a vaccine and it has low inflammation, but then it doesn't ever cause enough of an immune response to be protective, then it's sort of pointless. So um, people that design vaccines, they do all of this based on uh, you know, the 
amount of RNA they might put in the dose, um, the type of fats that they would put around the RNA. There's modifiers that they can put on either end of the spike protein mRNA that can affect how stable it is or how long it'll last. Uh, but the whole point is to try and hit this sweet spot right here, or I would say into this realm here, um, as long as there aren't severe side effects. What we don't want is this, and what we don't want is this. So here we are, um, less than a year since uh, really coronavirus came onto our radar. And how is it possible that we could be doing this so fast? And does, is that a reason for concern? So I want to share a few reasons I think that we were able to do this so fast. First off, there was a whole lot of preclinical data about coronaviruses before coronavirus, this one, ever came around. We had SARS in the early 2000s and MERS in the 2010s. Um, and they were potentially preparing to, to vaccinate for those diseases before they uh, wilted away on their own. Um, as we talked about, mRNA has been extensively studied as a mechanism for vaccines even before coronavirus. Uh, and I also think that um, unlike ever before, we have seen an incredible willingness to share data uh, across uh, the whole globe. And in fact, um, we had the genetic sequencing for coronavirus shared from China to the United States on January 10th of this year. I'm not sure any of us even knew what coronavirus was at that point. Maybe we've seen a news article or something about something, you know, on the other side of the world. Um, but by the time we actually started to think about it here, the genetic sequence had already been shared uh, with researchers in the United States who were already off to the races with mRNA vaccine development and other vaccine development. Um, and so the U.S. government engaged in what's called Operation Warp Speed, uh, which you probably heard about. They announced that program on May 15th. Um, it was already kind of rocking and rolling at that point. Monsef Slawi was... Um, or is still heading up the program, and he was uh, the head vaccinologist for GlaxoSmithKline, a, a huge vaccine producer worldwide. Uh, and, you know, the guy behind the guy, Superman back here, has been involved from the get-go, so um, can't say enough about everything uh, Dr. Fauci has done uh, through all of this. Um, but he has been deeply involved in the entire process as the director of um, the National Institute for Allergy and Infectious Disease. So when we think about vaccines, we usually think about this kind of linear process. You get all of this preclinical data that, you know, if it's a totally new thing, often takes years to learn about what the problem is and how do you fight it and all of that. Um, you might do a bunch of testing in animals to make sure that the vaccine is safe. Um, but eventually you have these stop points where you have to review the data and scientists review the data and regulators review the data and they make sure that this uh, makes sense, that it seems safe and that we're not skipping things. And once you get approval for that, then you go on to your phase one study where you recruit a small amount of human people, usually young people in their 20s, who get the vaccine and just make sure there's not like an immediate weird problem um, and because they're young and healthy, they're less likely to have, you know, long lasting trouble with that. And they're really heroes because they're taking on the unknown a hundred percent. Um, if that goes okay and gets reviewed, then you do phase two, which is a little bit of a bigger study where you're really trying to see, does the vaccine work to develop antibody? Does it actually develop immunity? You're not really looking for side effects in this study. You're trying to see, does the vaccine pretty much work? This is the big study. This is where the 60,000 people come in. These are huge studies. They take a long time to coordinate. Um, and even get ready. And what you're looking for here is, does the vaccine get you the outcome that you want, like preventing infection? Uh, and are there side effects when you give it to a whole bunch of people? And then finally you review that. And if that's okay, the company says, okay, let's make this vaccine. So that's why usually it takes years to get vaccines made is because of this whole process. Um, there's a lot of setup time, even before you run the trial setup often takes months to find sites to do it and make sure you have all your logistics ready to go. Um, you know, especially with cold chain and that sort of thing with these, uh, vaccines. Um, and then this review process, uh, obviously takes a long time. So I put this January 10th date. That's when we got the genetic sequence for this virus. And because of all the years of prior work on mRNA vaccines, they were able to immediately develop a phase one, uh, product for review. Uh, which they did, really starting back then. So what did Operation Warp Speed do? Frankly, I think it involved a lot of money. And what they were able to do was give money to six different companies using 
uh, three different platforms for vaccine technology. We talked about the different types of vaccines. So they, they wanted, they wanted um, options in all of those areas just in case one of them didn't work or had bad side effects or something. But basically by giving a whole bunch of money up front and a lot of logistical expertise and scientific expertise, uh, what they were able to allow companies to do was flip this linear and horizontal process to be a more staggered and uh, vertical process. So as soon as phase one started, as soon as they said, we have an mRNA vaccine candidate, they started the logistical setup of phase two from recruitment to finding sites to getting everything ready to go. Phase two trial in humans didn't start until phase one got reviewed and approved. Immediately when they started the phase one trial, they started setting up their giant phase three trial. So this was already happening back in January and February, finding sites, figuring out where we were going to do this. Um, again, they didn't start that trial until it was go time and we knew it was safe from phase two. And then production, uh, I think we're all keenly aware of production right now. Um, production was able to start immediately. They said, we know how to make this vaccine. Normally, we would wait until here because we don't want to invest billions in making it only to find out it doesn't work in phase three, which I can tell you often happens. Phase three trials don't always work. So the company doesn't want to start production until they know that this is going to work. So um, the U.S. government and governments across the world took risks and they invested a whole lot of money so that these companies could just start making the product now, way back at the beginning, so that by the time that phase three was able to be reviewed in full, the usual review process, they had already produced millions and millions of doses of vaccine. Things that made this work were all of the data that I told you about, um, uh, about pre-data and SARS and mRNA and all the cancer treatments and all of that. And I think there's another aspect of this too. You know, there was an incredible interest amongst all of us because of the devastation of this virus. Um, uh, you may note that I spelled heroes wrong here. Uh, heroes are actually fish. I don't know if you knew this. A, a hero without a knee at heroes, that, that's a type of fish. I don't think they probably had anything to do with this vaccine, but maybe through chaos theory somewhere along the way, these fish made a difference. But, but there's also the everyday heroes that, that took the time to be in vaccine trials, and we can't say enough about them um, and the uncertainty that they took on for all of us. Uh, so thank you, thank you, thank you to all of them. I think it's important to say that this virus is fast. We all know that, uh, but that makes studying a virus and a vaccine much easier. You know, if I can give 10,000 people a vaccine one day and then they go out in the world, I mean, there's a chance that a lot of them are going to encounter that virus within a couple weeks to a couple months, and then we can go analyze the data. This is much harder in something like HIV. You can give an HIV vaccine and then you have to wait 20 or 30 years to find out if people got HIV or not. And you know, by the time you find out it didn't work, now we're, you know, 40 years into our HIV epidemic without a vaccine, um, which is very frustrating for those people with HIV, but it's a different virus. It just, it moves so much more slowly. Um, and uh, this virus is very widespread right now. You know, if we were having no spread of coronavirus and we tried to run a vaccine trial, it would take forever to find out if the vaccine worked or not. So the fact that it is so widespread is actually what helped us uh, get to some answers sooner. And that's actually part of what Operation Warp Speed helped the companies do was identify areas early that were on that upswing of the curve and make sure that they got their product in the trial to those sites. So... Distribution obviously doesn't start until we finish the phase three trial and we find out if it worked and if it was safe. Um, so we're all learning uh, about distribution now. Let's talk about the trial really quick so you can see what they actually did. So it's a huge trial, people uh, all over the country and world working on this. And this is the, the most important curve that you'll see today. So uh, people in the blue got a placebo treatment. People in the red got the uh, mRNA vaccine. This is time zero of when they got the vaccine. And you'll recall that in the trial, they gave a second vaccine at day 21. So you can see these lines begin to diverge uh, at about day nine after the vaccine. And starting at about day nine, we see very few coronavirus infections. Um, and you know, why, why would that be? Well, a lot of people in the trial, they, they may have actually had coronavirus before they even entered the trial. It, as you know, it can take uh, seven to 14 days before you get symptoms and blah, blah, blah. So 
Um, what we're probably seeing here is some effect of that, but within eight to nine days after the first vaccine, we were already seeing this benefit. Um, people that did not get the vaccine but got uh, placebo um, basically got coronavirus uh, at a rate that you would uh, expect. And, you know, by the end of the trial, we basically saw um, a lot of placebo-related infections, 270. Well, and I shouldn't even say at the end of the trial. At this point in the trial, because the trial is ongoing. This is just their early data. Um, that there was this huge separation of um, people that, especially if you look after day seven, um, there was about a 95% efficacy between those who got the vaccine versus those who didn't, which is amazing. Um, we were hoping for 50%. This is the side effects slide that, that was produced in the journal article. This is impossible to read. So I'd like to thank this infectious disease fellow uh, from Atlanta who put this all together for us. Uh, and it's been shared widely at this point. Um, so this is the, the, the Pfizer vaccine. And basically, these are the side effects that were most common. So body aches, fatigue, headache, chills, fever, and GI symptoms. I want you to notice that people that got a salt water injection had 33% fatigue, 34% headaches, 11% myalgias, almost no fever, um, but 12% GI symptoms. What is that about? People in this trial wanted to get the vaccine. People wanted to be protected, and so they wanted to feel like they had some side effects to feel like they actually got it. So I think this was what's called a nocebo effect. It's, they, they wanted to feel some negative symptoms, and then they subsequently felt like they did. Um, but even beyond that desire to have some side effects, there were still higher levels of fatigue, higher levels of headache, higher levels of chills, some mild fevers, and not a lot of GI upset compared to placebo. There was also local pain at the site of the shot. So like your tetanus shots that you get, your arm hurts afterwards. It's sore, and that generally lasted a couple days. Um, a little bit of redness and a little bit of swelling at the site too as the immune system goes into that area and fights back about what you just put in there and thus creates that memory that you're looking for. So about a quarter of people had some uh, side effect, and these would all be considered uh, mild side effects. Um, if we jump back up to this slide here, red would be a severe, terrible side effect that you would never want to reintroduce anywhere. And there were really no red side effects uh, within the trial. Um, there was some severe side effects listed, which basically meant higher fever in this case, um, or symptoms that lasted longer than seven days. Um, you can see there's a smattering of those throughout the trial, but, but really we're talking about no side effects or mild side effects at the most. And again, no red. If we were to compare this to a flu vaccine, um, you would see that uh, probably there's going to be a higher amount of headache, a higher amount of fatigue, a um, uh, small amount more local pain. Um, but, you know, not like far and away rushing away from your flu vaccine. So 14% with flu, 26% with... But I do think this is something we need to prepare for. We need to prepare our patients for it once we're giving patients uh, the vaccine that... Um, they should probably get this vaccine the day before they don't have a lot of plans. Um, and, on, you know, here at Mary Greeley, we're planning on starting the vaccine process on Thursday and Friday, in part for this reason, just to kind of uh, allow some time for recovery. Um, and we're also not going to give the vaccine to a whole department at a time, because what we don't want is for the whole department to go down with, you know, headaches and some uh, fatigue. Uh, we need to have our, our team here. That's the whole point. Um, the Moderna vaccine, which we expect to be approved later this week, is essentially the same as the Pfizer vaccine, same process, mRNA-based. Uh, and, you know, this company did a separate trial from Pfizer uh, and basically got the exact same results, 95% efficacious. Um, people that got the vaccine did not develop severe disease even when they got coronavirus. Uh, and so now we have these two trials, two separate looks at this process, uh, both with the same degree of efficacy and both with the same uh, lack of any major severe side effects. So we expect to get uh, news of the Moderna um, vaccine being approved uh, later this week. And they are also planning to ship uh, by next week. So the advisory panel late last week voted 17 to 4 to approve this. Uh, Red flag went up in my mind. What about those four? Why did they vote no? Well, it turned out that um, the EUA, the emergency use authorization, goes down to 16-year-olds. Most of the data is 
from 18 year olds and up. So um, uh, these folks, two of them who were able to talk about it, a couple of them weren't able to talk about it because they're in the government. But the two that were able to talk about said that if they would have said 18 and up, they would have voted yes. They had no concerns. It was just an age related quibble in terms of science. Um, you know, is there a huge difference between a 16 year old and an 18 year old? Uh, I will let the pediatricians decide that. But I think ultimately they decided no, and 16-year-olds and up can get this vaccine. So then it got approved, and the CDC voted 11 to 0 to agree with that approval and move forward on Saturday. So here's our long, slow process. Here's our very fast process, and here we are at distribution. So it's approved. Um, so now we need to move forward with the next um, steps. So when we think about that... Um, I don't have time to go into the details here. I want you to know that there has been a huge amount of work uh, going on for months in the background through public health, through our hospital, through McFarland, in terms of preparation to have all the supplies we need, all the cold storage we need, uh, and basically working with the public health departments for distribution um, so that we can get vaccine here on site. Um, this, this slide does not do justice to the amount of work that's been going on for months, and thank you to everybody that's been involved with that. This is a photo from this morning. Vaccine has arrived at the university. Uh, we're expecting ours anytime. So uh, the challenge we will face is that we're not going to get enough in the first week to vaccinate everybody in our organizations. We expect about 200 doses in both organizations. And if you think about how many people work uh, at the clinic and the hospital, that'll um, maybe be about 15% uh, of those folks. Um, so basically... You know, all people in our organizations are considered phase 1A, the earliest phase, regardless of position, and we expect to have enough for everybody within a couple weeks. So, so this is not something we should be fighting about or worrying about. We're talking about a couple weeks time difference between the very first person and the very last person. Um, but that being said, we're planning to give the initial vaccines to all the people that are caring for COVID patients right now. Um, to help decrease their potential risk of transmission in that moment. Uh, then um, the two organizations are approaching things um, slightly differently just to kind of go out to those next rings as we go forward. Uh, and primarily that'll be a risk-based assessment about going forward who's at highest risk after those COVID care professionals. Um, but again, not something to let get you down. This is, we're talking about a couple weeks time until we get enough for everybody. And I would not see any major difference between the Pfizer or Moderna. I would have no qualms either way. Um, so within the emergency use authorization, these are the contraindications. Um, known allergies to the components. So these are the components. Um, there's some chemical names here that I won't try to pronounce. Here's the mRNA itself. There's some salt. There's some potassium. There's some more potassium. There's some more salt. Um, and a little bit of sugar. So there's, there's, you know, very little in here that I would recognize as being a strong producer of uh, allergy. Um, but people that have had bad allergies usually know what they had an allergy to. So um, that would be the main contraindication. Um, uh, we saw a few reports from the UK last week that people that had a history of severe allergies, uh, enough that they carried an epinephrine pen all of the time with them related to their severe allergies. Um, we've had actually three patients now in England that had some reaction. We don't know what the reaction was, but it was enough that regulators in the UK said, if you carry an EpiPen and have severe reactions, we recommend you hold off for now getting this vaccine. Um, that type of reaction was not seen in the 40,000 person trial. So uh, basically they're looking back into that and seeing what is it about those folks where this happened. Um, I can say that if I carried an EpiPen and I had a history of really severe allergic reactions, I'd be pretty hesitant to be the first uh, acceptor of this vaccine. I'd probably sit back and just wait a little while. But again, it depends on your personal risk of getting COVID too. I don't want you to get COVID either. Um, so in the EUA in the United States, this is not considered a contraindication. Um, having severe allergies to other things or carrying an EpiPen, um, the United States EUA did not restrict it from those people. So it is still you know, up to those folks to make that decision. Um, but I can tell you what I would do. Um, I think this is another thing that I was surprised by. Uh, in the big trial of this um, this product, a pregnancy and breastfeeding were people were excluded uh, from the study. And that's kind of a standard practice with vaccines and actually a lot of treatments um, just because of the potential risk to, to baby. Um, uh, 
so I was expecting that to be part of the exclusion. And in fact, in the UK, that is part of the exclusion early on. Um, here in the United States, um, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology strongly argued that, uh, or strongly suggested, it's not an argument, they're just suggesting uh, they, they um, advocated that uh, women be allowed to make this choice for themselves based on their preferences and values. Um, uh, and there's a lot of history that goes into why they're advocating for that, why they're advocating for something that's not really been studied to be given. Uh, but if you consider that women are at much higher risk for severe outcomes from COVID-19, and if you consider the number of women who may be in this category on the front lines of uh, coronavirus uh, treatment and care, um, and, and, and how different people have many different values when it comes to these sorts of things, you can imagine why... Um, really putting that decision back into the hands of the woman um, may make sense. Um, I'd like to hear a little bit more from our high-risk OB people before I would recommend a, a pregnant woman go get this vaccine. Um, I think based on my review of how this vaccine works, it's, it's probably totally safe. I mean, we do influenza vaccine, and that's an antigen-based thing, and all mRNA is doing is making an antigen uh, in a slightly different way. Um, it doesn't enter DNA. There's no reason to think that it would affect fetal DNA. So um, I would suggest a woman who is pregnant to think about what is their personal risk of getting COVID. Um, if it is really high and you consider that, you know, you, you may not do as well if you got COVID um, and you consider that this is probably very safe, then you might want to consider getting this vaccine even while pregnant. Um, but keep your eyes and ears open because I think we'll be hearing more from cellular biologists and molecular biologists and specialists in this area about telling us why or how this, this is safe. I'm going to blow through this one. There's some theories floating around on the internet um, that are spreading quickly um, through different social media platforms. This one was one that the vaccine will induce an antibody that cross-reacts with placenta and will lead to infertility. Um, that is... Uh, not founded on any science. It's, it's founded on the lack of science, you know, because people in these studies um, were not pregnant or breastfeeding and because the grand majority of them are not yet pregnant, there's no way to disprove this theory based on the studies. But we can say that this cross-reaction with the placental protein of syncytin is incredibly unlikely. In fact, vanishingly unlikely, according to molecular biologists. There's just two small sections of these proteins that are similar in terms of hundreds of sections on the protein. So the probability that those two similar sections would cause this cross-reaction would be vanishingly unlikely. Plus, we've not seen increased rates of miscarriage or loss of placental abruption in people that actually had COVID, which you would expect since the primary means of natural immunity is an anti-spike antibody. So if that were actually true, we should be seeing much higher rates of miscarriage, which we're not seeing in people that actually have COVID. We also have not seen increased rates of infertility in the years after SARS-1 came through. And, you know, a lot of women in Canada got that and then went on to have babies naturally. Um, you know, they have antibodies to SARS-1. And so if there was actually this anti-spike cross-reaction, we should have seen some downstream effect of that, which we didn't. We also have other attachment vaccines like influenza vaccines that might carry the same type of similarities. And we don't see anything there either. And if you consider the risk of infection itself, against all of this, you know, I think science that supports the notion that this is safe in women, um, I would feel comfortable giving this vaccine to my 12 year old daughter. I just, I don't think that there's anything here that makes me actually worry. Um, and I think our, our role is to just keep saying what we know, um, keep our radar up. But again, I don't, I don't have any meaningful concerns here. There's also been concern about, you know, our fetal stem cells being used in the production of these vaccines. Um, and the answer is no, Pfizer and Moderna don't use fetal stem cells uh, in the production of these vaccines. Some of the early mRNA research that's been done previously did use stem cells in that way, uh, but they're not currently being used. Um, so uh, some different organizations that um, have interest in this area have said they, they feel that the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines um, are okay for people that have concerns uh, along these lines. AstraZeneca does use some stem cells, fetal stem cells in the production of their vaccine is my understanding. Um, 
So there may be some preference that people would start to have on the type of vaccine they'd want to use. Uh, but again, these two early ones, um, there's no concerns. There are uh, many unknowns. We are walking into the unknown. Um, how long is it going to last? I don't know. The studies right now are about three months old in terms of the phase three studies. But these studies at 119 days uh, show almost no decrease in the amount of antibody, measured antibody in a person's serum. Maybe a slight decrease if you cross your eyes a little bit. Um, this was felt to be very reassuring that even in elderly people over 71, there was no meaningful decrease after three months. So the hope, I think, is that this is going to be lasting immunity. But we just don't know. And we're going to have to watch these numbers and see what this means. And we're going to have to remember that the immune system is much more complex than a simple antibody. You know, just because you don't have a measurable antibody doesn't mean your immune system doesn't have some memory of that event. So um, time will tell. Uh, but I think that's a big question. I think the effect of mutation is a question. Um, I don't think anybody knows that if, if this spike protein were to mutate somehow, could that decrease the efficacy of the vaccine? I guess you could imagine it might do that, but if it did mutate in that big of a way, then uh, it also wouldn't function very well to get the virus into your body. So we often will see that when viruses mutate away from their uh, wild type, that they lose fitness themselves and they become less severe or less contagious. Time will tell. What about those very, very rare side effects, those one in a million side effects? Uh, a study of 50,000 people or 40,000 people won't pick up in a one in a million side effect. Um, so uh, CDC has set up uh, basically a number of different monitoring mechanisms for people if they think they had uh, unusual side effects going forward. Um, and then what do we do when we get better vaccines later? Or if we do, it's hard to beat 95%, but maybe if it lasts longer or maybe if it has fewer side effects, it's going to be hard to study those people because most people have already gotten a vaccine. So how's that going to work? I don't know. I think that'll be a challenge. So how long um, are the people that got placebo in the study going to be kept in the study? You know, letting them be out there unprotected now that we know it works, it's a little bit of an ethical question. But the longer that we can keep going with that, the, the more reliable the data becomes. Um, so I don't have an answer. That's just an interesting question. Uh, when will be it available for everyone in the U.S.? I heard 20 million doses December, 30 million January, 50 million February. So you can see kind of a, a rapid increase in production volumes over time. I, I agree with what we're hearing, that by this summer, there'll probably be enough for everybody. And there are studies ongoing for this vaccine in children that were just started. So we'll have that data by the time we have enough to give kids. So will I get this vaccine when my turn comes? Yes. Um, would I recommend it to my family? Yes. When their turn comes? Yes. Um, uh, my wife is currently breastfeeding. I have no concerns about breastfeeding. Um, they weren't in the studies, but just with the way the vaccine works, I just don't think there's any reason to be concerned on, along those lines. What about people that don't want to get this vaccine? Um, you know, I would say maybe they have a reason they can't. Uh, maybe they just have more questions that they need answered. Maybe they have other reasons, but I would ask you to remember the third rule. We have a lot of things we fight about these days, and this does not need to be one of those things. Um, you know, initially we're not going to have enough vaccine for everybody anyway. So if somebody's out there saying they don't want to get it, that's okay. Give them some time. They'll, they'll look at data. They'll see what happens with this virus. And, you know, they may make their decisions. Um, I think we uh, often attribute people that don't want to get vaccines as all being part of one group of people that will never get vaccines. And that's just not true. There's a lot of very thoughtful people out there that just want to look at information and get a little bit more data before they um, make a decision for themselves. So this is not an area that we need to argue about, and I would encourage you all to try and avoid arguing about it. How long until the pandemic is over? This is the million dollar question. So this is our current curve. Um, depends on how many people take the vaccine, how fast does manufacturing happen, how does our behavior work, and how long does it last? But what I'd love to do is be able to flip this side of the curve over to this side. And what if this is what our curve looked like going forward? A few cases, few stragglers, but eventually by the time we get out here uh, into late next year, we have no cases. What does that mean for masking? Well, you know, everybody's seen this Swiss cheese analogy. You know, masks are a part of this. They keep viral particles going through. Um, staying away from people, physical distancing keeps particles from moving along. Uh, but here's this last one, this vaccine. And, you know, in terms of the Swiss cheese model, this is a really good piece of cheese. There are very few holes in it. It works really well. So my hope is that as we go forward, 
the more people that are able to kind of follow this whole pathway, the fewer virus particles that are around, and then all of a sudden we don't need to be doing anything, anything like this anymore. What I imagine will happen is that the curves will start to come down, and you'll start to see changes being made with people getting together more often, maybe wearing masks in fewer places, and then we'll see, does it bump back up or not? And if it continues to stay low and things continue to be okay, then that's when you might expect people to stop um, needing to wear masks in everyday uh, life. But I would uh, uh, bet that this is going to be uh, something of a step-by-step -step process over time. But remember, this last step really seems like it works. Uh, the more of us that do this last step, the faster this comes down. So this is a picture from the Badlands in South Dakota. This is sunrise. So uh, we've got hope on the horizon. And, um, you know, I think big changes are coming and it feels like this is where we start to fight back. So with that, I know I went longer than I meant to. Thanks everybody for your attention and I uh, would love to open it up to questions. So I'm looking at some question here. How long do cells, Dr. Gerbrocht is wondering, how long does mRNA last? Um, how long will it make the protein? Again, mRNA doesn't li live very long in the cells. So part of the reason for the second dose, and I do think even though the first dose probably starts the process, the second dose is really where the money is because your immune system is already primed. It's already ready to make this stuff. And then you hit it with it again, and then it really makes just memory. That's the whole idea. So uh, definitely take the time to get your second dose. Um, a lot of concerns about people planning future pregnancies. Um, so I, thanks for that question. We talked about it a little bit. Um, I have heard that in England, they're recommending people uh, try to avoid becoming pregnant for about two months after getting the vaccine. Um, like I said, we don't have any specific guidance from our own, uh, EUA here in the United States. Um, I think it just depends on your personal risk tolerance and your personal exposure to this virus. If you have a very high risk of exposure regularly and ongoing, uh, you would want to lower the threshold at which you would get this vaccine. Um, so I always try to ask myself, what would I recommend to my sister? Uh, I think I would tell her those exact things, but if she didn't have regular high level exposure, I might say to hold off a little bit and see how just keeping the other precautions would work. And, you know, there are going to be people that choose to get this vaccine and we're going to know that very quickly uh, over time. And there are women in the studies that became pregnant during the study and we're going to know that data over time. Um, so just think about it in terms of how quickly you want to adopt that. Um, yes, sir. If you cannot get the second dose at three weeks, would you try to get it a few days earlier or a few days later? A few days later. Um, only for safety reasons, I would say. Um, you know, if you do it too much, then you're potentially getting a much higher dose and higher risk of side effects. Um, but they have said that if you get it one week later or three weeks later, then it, it's okay. It'll still work in terms of the repriming process and memory process. So, you know, that 21 day thing is what they did in the study, but anything beyond 21 days they're saying is fine. I have not heard any statute of limitations on the second dose yet uh, in terms of if you get it after six months, you know, you do it twice. I haven't heard anything about that yet, but I'm sure we'll get there. Anybody, any reason somebody who has had COVID should not get vaccinated? Um, I don't think there's any reason not to get vaccinated, even if you've had COVID. Um, this is something that, you know, my personal bias is towards natural immunity. I think our immune systems are beautiful and elegant and um, should be the best producers of immunity out there. Um, but I would say that the studies show that after vaccination, your antibody levels are actually higher than if you actually had COVID, which, you know, it's, it's the thing we can measure. There's probably more than we can measure. Uh, so I guess the other thing is we've seen people get reinfected after they've had COVID before. Um, there's a lot of reasons for that. It's not the usual story, but I think that's, that's a potential thing too. So I guess my recommendation would be the, the downside of COVID is that overabundant immune response. So you probably wouldn't want to get vaccinated until at least a month after your COVID infection, just to allow that immune response to totally die down. That's kind of what I've recommended with flu vaccine too. just kind of let the COVID process, you know, resolve itself. Some people that's taking weeks and weeks, you know, um, 
But if you've had COVID, uh, I think definitely consider getting the vaccine anyway. They did look at that in the studies and there wasn't any increased risk or other side effects in people that had already had COVID um, when it came to the vaccine. There is this kind of notion of, you know, what if prior infection and immunity then can lead to kind of boosting of an overabundant immune response when you get the vaccine. Um, and we just didn't see that. That did not happen. Uh, and we did not see uh, people that got the vaccine when they got COVID infection. They didn't seem like they got more sick. In fact, they seemed like they had milder forms of the disease. I think within our organizations, we're kind of looking at that 90 day time interval when we expect people to have pretty good immunity in terms of prioritizing who gets this vaccine when. But at the end of the day, um, when we have enough to do everybody, I'm fine with everybody getting it and would recommend it. Can I still spread coronavirus? Uh, so no. So if you've been vaccinated, the notion would be that if you got coronavirus, you know, exposed and got it in your nose before it ever gets off to the races to a point where then you could then spread it to somebody else, um, you know, then the whole point of the vaccine is to prevent you from being contagious. Uh, but it's 95% effective. It's not 100% effective. So if people are thinking about... Um, you know, at risk family members or gatherings over time, especially when we are at a point where there is still a lot of coronavirus in the community, you would still want to be thoughtful about those things. You would still want to um, try to avoid people who are at very high risk and also wear masks and stuff in public. But as we go and see the numbers drop and drop and drop, as we expect, if there's very little coronavirus in the community and you have 95% immunity, you know, then the odds are in your favor. At that point, then we can all start to relax a little bit. So um, it's a little bit of a double-sided answer. I would say if we're in the midst of our outbreak as we are, I would still um, be very careful about that. Um, do I think it will be yearly? Uh, I don't know. I hope not. I hope this is just a one-time deal. Um, if it was yearly, I'd gladly do that, though. Just batch it with my influenza vaccine. Um, I guess it depends on a lot, but I think we'll know more over time. If we totally shut this virus down, you know, if we're able to get a lot of people vaccinated and there's very little coronavirus in the community anywhere, and it looks like the vaccine is lasting well into the future, I, I don't know that you'll be seeing a lot of revaccination unless we start to see outbreaks uh, happening again in the future. Um, I expect by next year, though, as we are again coming into kind of the coronavirus season, that we'll have a lot of good guidance on the basis of those studies um, and, and uh, just the experience of countries getting coronavirus vaccine. So I don't have an answer for how long it's going to last or if it'll be annually. It might be, but it might not be. It's <laughs> a good answer. Um, does it change anything with regard to testing? Um, you know, that's a good question, and I've seen some discussion about that, but I haven't seen uh, answers. So the question is, is, you know, if somebody gets the vaccine and gets some fever and body aches, um, you know, should they still consider coronavirus testing? Could it be that they were very unlucky and they got coronavirus the day before they got their vaccine or something like that? And uh, that seems very possible, I think, for a lot of people with... Um, you know, early symptoms of coronavirus, they are waiting to get tested for a couple days to try and increase the sensitivity of the test. Uh, you know, I, I think we've all kind of had to think about this, especially in our kids, you know, is a sniffle worth going in and getting tested? And I think what I would recommend people do is just consider the fact you just got vaccinated. I expect you to have some low-grade fever and body aches. If those don't resolve after a day or two, or if they're moving beyond what you expect them to be, especially if you're getting cough, because cough is not on the list of side effects from this thing. Uh, if you're getting more cough or more respiratory symptoms, not just those systemic symptoms, then yes, you should go get tested. If not, I don't know, be thoughtful, stay at home, wait a couple days, uh, and as long as you feel fine coming out, the other end, then let it be. Um, I'm not sure I can read Dr. Lowry's, but do you have the capacity to spread the virus? Again, so it's 95% effective, so you would have this 5% chance of actually getting virus. I haven't seen any data that, that talks about 
of those people that were vaccinated and still got diagnosed with coronavirus, are they more likely to be contagious or not? We've not seen any data about that. They're less likely to get severely ill. That's what the early data is showing us, which there's an implication that they have less total virus because of that. Um, but nobody knows. So early, while we have a lot of disease in the community, I would still take some precautions um, about the potential for being contagious. But again, as we move forward and those curves go down, the risk goes down and we can um, relax. Okay, I think we answered that one already. I think, yes, you can still get vaccinated later, one month later or so. Um, that's a, I, can it be controlled? Well, it, it can be controlled by a number of different factors within the vaccine itself. Um, that has to do with the dosing. It has to do with the, um, where, where is this? So, you know, it has to do with the dose of the vaccine that's given. It has to do with some of the adjuvants that they can put on it or some of the modifications. Um, but that's all done preclinically. Um, that's not something that they would do, um, you know, they wouldn't give you a, a, an inflammation booster with the vaccine because you might overreact and you don't want to blunt the immune response either. I would say that taking things like Tylenol and ibuprofen after a vaccine, um, it, it probably doesn't affect the efficacy of the vaccine at all. So people should feel free to, to still do that. Um, what's the efficacy of the vaccine in like deeply immunocompromised people? I don't know. So, you know, the, the people with leukemia or on very high doses of steroids, um, I think we'll find out over time, but right now I don't think we know. Um, this is a good question. So I, I don't know how Iowa Heart is doing um, their vaccination process. Um, yes. Okay, so different organizations have different ways of doing it, but it sounds like we will let Dr. Um, we'll let you know the specific answer for you about that. But um, in general, I think the, the different risk groups are gonna be uh, contacted probably by email um, to let them know and then schedule times and, and all of that. There is this kind of cold chain necessity where you, know, you have to keep it cold so long and once it's out, you only have so long and then it comes in actually five dose vials. So we'll wanna be doing it at least in batches of five. Um, so, uh, so different organizations are, are going to tackle that in different ways, but I think both of our organizations will reach out to people. Uh, that's a really good question. So public health and the companies have given us very specific instructions about how to reconstitute these things. And, um, as a non-pharmacist and as a non-nurse that's doing the actual action of this, I, I, can't, I can't tell you how easy it is, but I also know that the people doing it are going to be doing it time and time and time and time again. And so I trust them that they'll be doing it fine. Um, Amber, did you have something to add there? Well, I was going to say pharmacy is very much involved for Mary's really. Yeah. Using it. So the experts yeah, I, I would feel comfortable that they're, they're well aware of the requirements and I would uh, feel confident in that process. So that's the question about the immune issues. Um, uh, I have not seen any uh, increased rates of autoimmunity, which was the second part of that question. So, you know, if you look at this, you know, a severe reaction would be, you know, what if I have rheumatoid arthritis and is this gonna make my joint disease much worse? Um, that should have come through as in the study, um, you know, one of those red things, um, an induced autoimmune disease would be considered a grade four severe outcome. Uh, and we didn't see that. Uh, and I would also say that people with autoimmune disease are at higher, higher risk from COVID itself. So I would encourage people uh, to get the vaccine unless we hear otherwise from the, you know, the post distribution monitoring system that there's risk. Uh, but I haven't seen any specific risk there.
So the natural desire is to stop masking. And I would, I would strongly encourage everyone to continue wearing masks. Um, like I said, that curve, we're on the upscale in terms of our country. We were on a little bit of a downslide here in Iowa, but there's no reason to think we couldn't get hit by another wave any day, especially if we let our guard down. So we need to control what we can control. And masks is a way to do that. Um, our behavior is a way to do that. Uh, and the vaccine is a way to do that. And they will work in concert. And, you know, remember those polio and measles graphs. Th these things, they can have such a profound impact. Uh, people washed their hands in the 1940s, you know, um, and still we had polio. So, um, so give it time. I think we'll get there. But I would keep wearing your mask. Uh, no, no. So... Um, this vaccine will not give you a false positive COVID PCR test in your nose. That's a good question. Um, uh, the, the, the RNA that we measure for the PCR test uh, in our nose, um, you know, that is only going to be transiently in your body being used to make the protein that then acts as the vaccine. So, and it's not in your nose either. Uh, it's, you know, an injection intramuscularly. So, so no, that shouldn't give you a false positive nose test. Um, so I would say for immunocompromised individuals, I can't tell you how well this will work, but I would say get it. I mean, I don't think it's going to hurt you. Um, it will probably help. And the degree it helps will probably depend on your functional immunity or functional immune system. Um, but, you know, just like influenza, there is benefit even when your immune system isn't normal. So I would say, say you could, you should still get this. Okay. Would you need a second dose of the vaccine or um is there any reason not to pre-treat with um Tylenol and naproxen? Um you know, that is a good question. I told you it probably doesn't matter once you're symptomatic. Um you know, fever is part of our natural immune response. Uh it's a sign the immune system is working. It's not overtly dangerous in and of itself. Um so I probably would not pre-treat, uh, you know, only 25% of people will have side effects anyway. Um, and I do want the immune system to have a good fighting shot to get started with this thing. Uh, so if you get symptoms later, go ahead and use those, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't try to preempt them. Um, would you need a second dose if you're getting the vaccine after the COVID infection? Yes. Uh, only because that's how it's studied. And I would have no way of knowing if, if one dose is sufficient. You know, I understand the question. You've already had it. You're already kind of primed. But remember, this is a, this is a very specific way of stimulating your immune system. And so it may do it in a way that um, is slightly different than natural immunity. And so I would encourage people to still get the second dose. Um, let's see. Can we go to the next one? Thank you, Ravi. <laughs> Uh, what was the, what was the one that said, that this is a silly question. I didn't see that one. Can we go up one? Um, so if, if people get the antibody test several, you know, like a month later, then yeah, you probably will test positive for the antibody test, but you shouldn't test positive in your nose. Um, Well, I would expect the vaccine to be effective, to start to be effective within one to two weeks, just based on the way those curves separated. Um, I think over time, the longer that study goes on, we'll see if, if, if the curve becomes even more flat, you know, after the three week mark, um, when you get the second dose, then you'd say, well, maybe immunity is even better after the second dose, but it does seem like immunity kicks in by day 10. Um, the, the slopes of those two curves really started to separate uh, by day 10 here. Again, I'm not recommending anybody go out and go to a big party after that. I mean, we still need to take precautions otherwise. Um, but yeah, I think for everybody's peace of mind by day 10, you have some immunity. Yes, I've not heard any contraindication to getting other vaccines uh, before or after this vaccination. You know, your immune system's encountering hundreds and thousands of things every day. So, you know, batching vaccines together, I don't, I'm not too worried about. I presume 
yes, we'll have to do that. So if you know you get a Pfizer vaccine this week, then in three weeks you'll need to get a Pfizer vaccine again. I, we will not be cross cross treating with these different vaccines. So they'll keep track of all that. We'll keep track of all that, and I don't need to be part of it. But again, I would consider them interchangeable, interchangeable from a functional standpoint, and I would be happy to receive either one. Well, that's a good question. Um, I would I would wait a month on that. I, I think in general, people that have gotten the bamlanivimab and the Regeneron products, we can ask Dr. Killian for input there too, but um, those antibodies, they're not long, long lasting. I, I usually think of monoclonal antibodies as lasting a month to six weeks. Um, could that otherwise affect immunity? I don't know the answer to that. I think if you did it too soon, maybe it could because your immune system would just rely on the monoclonal product. Uh, I don't know that though. And I would probably want to give it some time. That's a good question. But you should also have natural immunity because you've actually had the, the disease. So you should be good for at least a couple months anyway. People in senior housing, are they included? Um, so, so yes, as part of phase 1A, it's healthcare providers and people that are living in long-term congregate settings. Um, I think all of those folks are, all those organizations are doing it in a slightly different way, but I have heard that the plan is to start a kind of a, a very wide process uh, the week of Christmas. Um, I can't tell you a lot of details on that because they're different organizations, but I think the goal is to try and, yes, uh, long term care facilities first with healthcare workers because 40% of the mortality from the disease is in people in long term care. So it just has to do with severity of illness, uh, why, why those folks are being prioritized first. Uh, and then there's been some discussion, but I understand phase 1B will be um, uh, frontline workers uh, that, that are essential um, to the function of society. And I've seen teachers are, are potentially included in that. And then phase 1C is uh, people uh, at high risk with immunocompromising conditions or uh, advanced age. Um, so if you think about the timing of that 20 million this month, 30 million January, 50 million February, I mean, that, that kind of takes care of phase one through February. So I, I would think in terms of a time frame for phase one, it's through February. I can't comment on transplant uh, recipients or cancer specific things because they didn't talk about that in the studies. Um, but I don't see any reason to think this would harm those folks. Um, and it certainly wouldn't harm them as much as actually getting COVID would. So I would say that they should be vaccinated when they can. Um, no, uh, great question. You, you cannot get COVID from this vaccine. It's not alive. It's just this little snippet of RNA that only encodes for one protein. So this is not a, an alive virus. It's not even a dead virus. It's just a little bit of, of genetic material that causes your body to make a protein that then causes an immune response. So you cannot get COVID from this uh, injection. If you get COVID right after the vaccine, that means that you'd gotten it somewhere else. You didn't get it from the vaccine. Um, and so then by virtue of extension, you can't give it to your family after the vaccine. Uh, and in fact, you're, you're less likely to do so, uh, after you get a week or so out. Oh, good. Thanks, Kelly. So Kelly Hartwig is saying the CDC just put out yesterday that they're recommending 90 days after monoclonal antibodies. So if you got the BAM product or Regeneron, then wait 90 days to really allow that antibody to be flushed out of your system. But again, you should have good COVID immunity anyway for that 90 days. So it should be um, a non-issue. Uh, thank you for answering that. And they included convalescent plasma um, in that too. So a lot of people have been um, you know, treated with convalescent plasma. I think that was, you know, that was hope when we needed hope. And even though it didn't, didn't end up working as well as we wanted it to. I, I just really appreciate all the effort the community put in um, to making that happen. So, okay. Well, thanks everybody for who stuck around and for all the great questions. Really appreciate all your time. We're going to learn more every day, um, but uh, I, this is where we fight back. This is where we push back. And uh, I think we're going to see a big change in the coming months. So thank you again.